Our scripture reading this morning is John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and can be found on page 1049 in the Pew Bibles. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. Amen. And so we have made it to the fourth Sunday of the season of Advent. We have come together for four weeks, and now we come together again in this fourth week to gather in the darkness of these days and weeks of December leading up to Christmas. Not because we seek the darkness, but because we seek the light. And even though it may sound counterintuitive, sometimes it is only when, as we heard last week, sometimes it's only when God puts out our lights that we can finally see that spark of hope that we have been searching so desperately for. Over the course of the past few weeks, we have had several guides on our way to the manger, each having something different to teach us along the way. We have spent some time with Mary, we've spent some time with Joseph, and we've even spent some time with our own sense of the darkness when it descends upon us. But mostly we have been led by an anonymous poet who taught us through three simple statements that it is possible to have hope even in what seems like the most hopeless of situations. Over the last few weeks, we've taken each of these statements and we have looked at them through the lens of the first chapter of each of the Gospels because we know that each of the Gospel writers have their own perspective, their own focus, their own idea about what it is that we need to know about this person of Christ that we follow. We have read each of those statements, those three statements. We have sung them. We have prayed them. We have picked them up and turned them over and over, and we've even held them up to see if, how they catch the light. But this week we're going to do something that we haven't done with them yet. We're going to take them at face value. We're going to look at these words for what they really are, an affirmation of faith. Let us pray. Most gracious and merciful God, we continue our journey this day, still searching for the things we may not even understand yet. We pray that we have been faithful along the way, and when we haven't, that we have at least been open to the learning. Speak to us again in this moment, O blessed Creator, and create in us the desire to keep moving forward no matter how dark things might seem. Amen. I believe in the sun even when it is not shining. I believe in love even when I don't feel it. I believe in God even when God is silent. An affirmation of faith containing three simple statements of belief. Ever since the worship team and I began talking about this particular series, I haven't been able to shake how much this, those three statements remind me of another affirmation of faith containing three simple statements. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Anyone who is familiar with it knows that that is a brief part of the Apostles' Creed. And if you know the Apostles' Creed, you know that there is also so much more to it. It goes on to speak of Jesus' birth and death and resurrection. It speaks of the Holy Spirit's work in the community of faith. And legend has it that 
after the Spirit descended upon the disciples in the book of Acts on that day of Pentecost, legend has it that the Apostle Peter spoke up and said, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And when he stopped talking, the Apostle Andrew said, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. And they went around the, the table like that, a dozen disciples, a dozen sentences, for statements, forming the Apostles' Creed. Now, granted, the Apostles' Creed, as we know it, was not, doesn't show up until the 8th century. However, individual lines do show up in some of the 2nd century post-apostolic -ap writings. And so we can be pretty sure that these statements that we now speak, when we speak the Apostles' Creed, we can be pretty confident that they're at least derived from, if not exactly what the apostles themselves said when they made their statement of belief. But regardless of where the words came from and how many statements there are and, and how they fit together and who said them and when they showed up, at its core, the Apostles' Creed is an affirmation of faith containing those three simple statements of belief. I believe in God. I believe in Christ. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Now, creeds are as much summaries as they are affirmations of faith. We, and we actually refer to them more as affirmations of faith than creeds. There's actually nine of them in the back of our own hymnal, but there are only two that are considered creeds. Generally, we refer to these things as affirmations of faith. But they are meant to take huge concepts and massive amounts of sacred writings and to be able to say those things as briefly as possible, still maintaining the core sentiment. The Apostles' Creed, when taken as a whole, is a quick summary of the entire biblical canon, a bird's eye view of, uh, of a story that has taken over thousands of years to be told and written. And since our faith began in and among people who really didn't write, read or write too much, it had to be short and it had to be memorable. Because in the earliest of years, uh, in the earliest years of Christianity, hundreds of Christians facing persecution and probable execution, they refused to bow down to the gods of the Roman Empire. Instead, they stood their, their ground, often right before they were executed. And they said, I believe in, the God, in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and, earth, heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. No matter what the amount of violence and cruelty that they were facing, or the threat of it, it would not get them to renounce Christ or his mission. Jesus' earliest followers were fully committed to following his commandments, and more often than not, that devotion meant that they literally gave their lives for Christ. Additionally, in the earliest days of Christianity, early converts, they would spend months in instruction and studying of the faith. And all the while, they would pray and they would fast. And then at the end of their instruction, which would happen on Easter Sunday, they would have an all-night prayer vigil. And it culminated the next day when they would wade into the water. And when they were baptized, they were asked right before they were immersed, do you believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth? Do you believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? And after answering each question, they were immersed in the water until it had happened three times and the baptism was complete. In 325 AD, the Nicene Creed came along, and it is much wordier and more detailed than the Apostles' Creed because its original function was wordier and more detailed than the Apostles' Creed. Because you see, for 300 years, for the first 300 years of Christianity, it, Christianity had gone through quite the uh, rapid metamorphosis, if you think about it. In the earliest days, we know, 
from our own sacred text, they were a persecuted sect, first of Judaism and then separately a part of Christianity itself. But a lot of people considered them a cult or something like that. And because they wouldn't bow down to the Roman Empire, they were often persecuted. And so they went on from that through the course of those 300 years when the Emperor Constantine decided that he had a, um, he went into battle with the cross on his shield, he won the battle and all of a sudden Christianity became the, um, the legal, the, the imperial government's official religion. And that was just happened over the course of 300 years. And so, since that was its, its metamorphosis prior to that, it really didn't have any rules, except for the ones that Jesus himself had given Christianity's followers. Because really, prior to that, all they had been worried about was their own survival and the survival of the faith and the spreading of the faith. So they didn't take time to come up with any rules. But in 325, the first council of Nicaea was convened to figure some out. It was basically Christendom's first official attempt to define who we were and how we act now that we were no longer illegal. And so they emerged with the Nicene Creed and they hoped that it would speak to what it is that we believe and clear things up, but it would also, they hoped that it would also speak against what they considered to be the heretical beliefs of the, daily, of the day specifically related to Jesus himself. So you see, as Christians, we have a long history of speaking to and declaring, and yes, even trying to figure out what it is we believe. We come from a long line of people who have tried their best to put voice to their beliefs in all kinds of situations and circumstances and for all kinds of reasons. It's always been our way to tell the world who we are, what we believe, and, and how we are in the world. And we hope that, they are, that we do this in terms that are easy to remember and hopefully easy to understand. And each time we put voice to our own beliefs, each time we lift our voices and say the creeds together, we join our voices with all of those that have gone before us. We step into a long, steady river that has been flowing long before we came along, and it will be flowing long after we are forgotten. It's the story of our faith, and it's filled with stories of believers and doubters and martyrs and seekers and missionaries, and every single one of them has stood in that river at some point the river we now stand in. When we say, I believe in God, we become part of something so much bigger than ourselves. And we're actually saying more about God than we are saying about ourselves. I believe is not the same thing as saying, I feel or I want or I think, but it's saying God is. It's our way of saying, I cast myself upon God. I attach myself to God. I believe makes the statement that everything I have and everything I am, I will put in the care of God. But here's the thing. Even though we say those creeds and affirmations of faith together, we say those powerful words out loud and boldly. We say, I believe. In spite of that, we still say, I believe. Because while we may share our statements of faith and our stories of our faith, our faith journeys are ultimately our own. And no one can go on them except for us with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. No one else can take these journeys for us. No one else can do the believing for us. And no one else, no one can make us believe. And that's one of the most powerful lessons about the season of Advent. Because it is in the season of Advent that the rubber 
hits the road on our faith journeys. And just like I have said every week during this series, we must be willing to spend some time in the darkness of the season of Advent and not be too much in a hurry to rush to the light of Christmas in order to receive the lesson of this season. We have to take our time. Because we may speak of and affirm our faith in the light, but we learned it and it was strengthened in the dark. We can stand together with Christians everywhere and at all ages and from all time. And we can say the words, I believe, but the season of Advent teaches us that sometimes, sometimes those words don't become real until we have added the words, even when. Far too often the darkness descends and our faith is tested and sometimes the question is no longer do I believe, but it becomes can I believe? Can I believe that the sun will ever shine again even when it doesn't seem possible that it ever will? Can I believe that I, can, that I will ever trust enough to love again even when the sting of betrayal is more than I can stand? Can I believe that God is truly there and cares about me even when I am surrounded by the dark, deafening silence of God's apparent absence? And whether we feel like it or not, we usually think that if we don't have two feet planted firmly in the realm of belief, we're not doing it right. And perhaps we don't always have to think about that because all the glitter and the noise of the holiday season distracts us. But it is in those in-between moments that we spend alone when we begin to tremble just a little bit. You know those moments when we're in the car between here and there. Those moments in the shower those moments right before we fall asleep, when we are alone with our thoughts and our fears and our worries. Those are the moments that the pain and the fear and the worry, possibly even the doubt, don't just creep up on us, but launch a full assault. And while our belief tries to tell us to wait and watch and hope, we become more and more concerned that maybe we just don't have it in us. And sometimes it is in the waiting and the watching and the hoping that we become so very weary of the waiting and the watching and the hoping. We get the fact that we need a savior. We understand that. But where is he? When is he gonna get here? How long, oh Lord, how long? Because quite frankly, we just don't know how much longer we can hang on. but it is precisely the quiet darkness of Advent that gives us the space we need to find the strength we need. It lets us cry out and wonder and question. And it comforts us with the knowledge that we are not alone in our crying out and our wondering and our question. And I'm not just talking about the people that are sitting beside us because the season of Advent calls us to step into that long, steady river that has flowed long before we ever got here and will flow long after we are long forgotten. It's the river that carries the great story of our faith. It tells uh, the story of the ones that have gone before us, the ones that cried out, the ones that wondered, the ones that questions, the believe the, the question, the believers, the doubters, and the seekers. Because you see, Christians have a long history of speaking to and declaring our faith. And maybe even trying to figure out what exactly it is that we believe. We come from a long line of people that have tried their best to put their voice, put voice to their beliefs in all kinds of situations. 
and for all kinds of reasons. Even when the question wasn't, do we believe, but rather, can we believe? Can we believe that God can create unfathomable beauty, not just out of nothingness, but out of shamefulness and despair and ugliness or the most hopeless of situations? Can we believe that we will be set free from the things that hold us captive? Can we believe that out of unconditional and eternal love for us, God came down at Christmas, leaving the comfort and the safety of the heavens to walk beside us in every moment of the human experience and condition? Can we believe that the infant in the manger will save us? Can we believe that what has come into being in him was life and the light of all people and that that light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not, nor will it ever be able to overcome it? Can we believe all these things? Even when they seem impossible, even when we're afraid to believe, even when we have absolutely no idea where God is in all of this or what God could possibly be up to, can we believe? Well, my brothers and sisters, be ready. Because the one thing that should never surprise us is that God will always surprise us. God never moves where or when, or how we expect, but God is always on the move. Creating, redeeming, and sustaining our lives in ways that are so baffling that they can only be of God. And so we should never be afraid to spend some time in the light, in the darkness. And we should never be afraid to hope to stand in the light. We should never hesitate to boldly shout the words, I believe, nor feel ashamed if we also whisper the words, even when. Because it is in the wondering and the questioning and the waiting and the watching that the people of God have always found their way to the manger. To behold the greatest source of hope and glory that this world has ever seen. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, some of us have come this day and walked through the light to get here. Some of us feel the light of love and hope and joy and it embraces us in ways that we can't express, but we never wanted to stop. And Lord God, some of us walked through the darkness to get here today. In the places where we wonder and we cry out and we question, and we feel just a little bit lost. And Lord God, we thank you that whether it is the light or whether it is the dark, you are there beside us. And we do confess, Lord God, that sometimes when we say, I believe, boldly and loudly, we also pray, help my unbelief. Lord God, we pray that as we go through this journey, not just to the manger, but our journey of faith, that we remember that it is you who guides us, that it is you who we proclaim, and that it is you who hold us in the palm of your hand. Encourage us, empower us, give us hope. Give us bread for the journey so that we can be strong and steady and invite others to join us along the way. We pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Shine. 